la decana que Dagmar Guardiola. Okay, muchas gracias. Muy buenas tardes. ¿Se oye? Muy buenas tardes. Estamos recomenzando la actividad. Buenas tardes. ¿Se oye por aquí? Hola, ¿se, se escucha? Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Me uno al saludo protocolar del doctor Rodríguez Esquerdo, eh, que se dirigió a ustedes al inicio de esta actividad. Eh, quiero aclarar que yo no voy a hacer ninguna presentación. Yo lo que voy a hacer es darles un breve mensaje de bienvenida, eh, porque los especialistas en la materia ya algunos han hecho sus presentaciones y tenemos a la doctora Price eh, en adelante también con la suya. Básicamente, quiero decirles que a nombre de la Facultad de Ciencias Sociales, deseo expresarle las más sinceras condolencias y solidaridad a la familia de uno de nuestros más distinguidos miembros de esta comunidad académica, el doctor Sidney Mens. Nos hemos reunido aquí en esta tarde para reconocer y celebrar su vida y su obra y su legado que ha dejado a generaciones de estudiantes y estudiosos de esta universidad de la región del Caribe y del mundo entero. Y como hemos visto a través de algunas de las presentaciones de los colegas que son especialistas en la obra de Sidney Mintz, una de sus grandes aportaciones fue reconocer y nombrar a esta región eh, por su importancia sociocultural, también geográfica, eh, de la que somos parte y a la que pertenecemos. Región que necesariamente y naturalmente constituye la esencia, el fundamento y, si quieren, el contexto para el desarrollo del conocimiento y de los saberes en cualquier disciplina, no solo las ciencias sociales. De manera que su obra trascendió y desbordó esa frontera disciplinaria. ¿Cómo entender al mundo sin comprender como caribeños o comprendernos como caribeños. Creo que la obra de Sidney Mintz nos hizo y nos sigue haciendo una significativa aportación en esta dirección. Finalmente, quiero agradecer su generosidad que se ha manifestado de tantas maneras y particularmente por habernos donado su colección a la Facultad de Ciencias Sociales de este recinto. También por haber amado tanto a este país y a la universidad, las que hizo suyo. Finalmente, quiero agradecer al doctor Lowell Fiet nuestro director del Instituto de Estudios del Caribe y a todo su equipo de trabajo, así como también los compañeros de la oficina del decanato que de muchas formas colaboraron para hacer la realidad esta actividad. Les deseo una jornada productiva que ya veo que lo está haciendo y espero recibirlo en la colección del archivo de las ciencias sociales en el Caribe eh, más tarde donde inauguraremos esa sala y honraremos también su memoria eh, y, y de Luis también. Así es que muchísimas gracias y les dejo entonces con la próxima expositora, que es la doctora Sally Price.
Sally is going to speak in English, so I'm going to read a brief summary of her work in Spanish. Una reflexión sobre la naturaleza de las colecciones de bibliotecas, museos y archivos, seguida por una evocación personal sobre Gordon Lewis y, en particular, Sidney Mintz, por cuya estrecha relación con Richard y Sally Price. Tuvo gran influencia en sus carreras en antropología desde el, los 1960 en adelante. Bien. Sally Price, que ha dado cátedra, she's taught en Stanford, Princeton, William Mary, Minnesota, además de la Universidad Federal de Bahía, Brasil, y que la Sorbona en París. So, also in Brazil and in Paris in La Sorbona. The, ha escrito extensamente sobre aspectos de la cultura de la diáspora africana, desde Harlem y el sur de los Estados Unidos hasta el bosque pluvial de la Amazona. So she's written about the African diaspora, the, from, from Harlem, the South United States, the, the, and the, the Caribbean and South America. Okay. The, the, además, she coeditó Caribbean Contours con Cindy Pitts. So she's also the co-editor of Caribbean Contours, which is still in use, by the way, a book that is easily available and still use, in use in classes. Okay. Y, no obstante, es mejor conocido por dos estudios críticos del lugar de que el arte primitivo en el imaginario de espectadores occidentales, que primitive art in civilized places, que, y ahora que eso existe en ocho idiomas diferentes, y es el primer lugar donde yo encontré el nombre de, de Sally Price, okay. y también Paris Primitive. Jacques Chirac's Museum and the Quay Bradley. Okay? Entonces, so those two books best characterize or are most popular among her works. ¿Sí? Es miembro electro de la Academia Real Holandesa de Artes y Ciencias y en Francia también es miembro de la, or de la Orden de las Artes y la Letra. Okay? Chevalier de las Artes y la Letra. Okay? Bien. Y tengo eh, una anécdota breve antes de presentar a Sally, simplemente, it's the second time that I've had the opportunity to invite the Sally and Richard Price to the University of Puerto Rico. The first time was in 1999 when we were finishing up a project called Caribbean 2000 and we were doing a very large symposium with very other, various other invited members, one of them being the performance artist Guillermo Gomez Peña. The, and at that time, the project was called Confusión Cultural, Cultural Confusion. Okay? Entonces, con el sentido tanto de confusión como with fusion. Okay? Entonces, que ellos entonces vinieron en ese momento y entonces que, que Sally había sacado un libro. She had just published a, a libro called The Maroon Hearts and she spoke about it, and Richard had recently published the, the very, very popular book that was translated into Spanish here, the, but you have to help me with the title, the, and the current, what's the? Presidario. Yeah. El Presidario y el Coronel. Yeah, okay. El Presidario y el Coronel, que es brillante, existe en español, además de inglés. Bien. But they, so this is the second time I've been able to invite them, and I expect that this time will be the, as beneficial and as enjoyable as the first. Okay. Presento a la doctora Sally Price. Thank you very much. I am really delighted to be here again. Uh, is this working? No. Is that better? Okay, I am delighted to be here again among so many old friends 
and it's a particular pleasure for me to be back in touch with the Lewis family. It's been much, much too long. Okay. Is this working? Yes, I can hear it. I can hear it. Okay, um, I want to begin on a negative note by explaining what I'm not going to be doing in this lecture. I'm not going to be going over Gordon Lewis's legacy to Caribbean studies because of the fact that that will be the subject of Rich Price's lecture tomorrow. I also will not be offering a general assessment of Sid Mintz's contributions since there has been no shortage of memorials and obituaries since his death a couple of months ago and I feel like adding another one of that sort would simply be redundant. Instead, I've decided to begin this lecture with some brief comments about the challenges of organizing and managing library collections and related assemblages, and then go on to very personal memories of my encounters over the years, first with Gordon and Sybil, and then with Sid. But before that, I want to say just a word about the personal reason why, as, aside from my Caribbean involvements, that I was so very pleased when Lowell invited me to do this lecture on the occasion of a major event in the history of a university library. It's simply that my father, let's see, where, here we go. Uh, Page down. My father spent his whole life as a university librarian, and he wrote what is, I believe, that's, oh sorry, that was supposed to happen earlier, okay. He wrote what I believe is the only general book on the history of university libraries, so that's one reason. I'm also the mother of a literary scholar who was born, by the way, in Sid and Jackie's house when they were on leave in Paris, a literary scholar who manages a neighborhood book exchange in front of her house as part of the, let's see, yes, I can see, okay, as part of the little library movement and takes her students on tours of the rear book library as part of her courses at Harvard on the history of the book and also writes about literary collections of another kind, that is to say, anthologies. So I find myself uh, sort of caught between these two bookends, so to speak, of library-oriented family members, which might, or maybe might not, have to do with the fact that I've become involved in a related class of institutions that, like libraries, are centered on collections, which is to say, museums. Rich, you have to tell me if the pictures aren't right, because I don't have them here. I tend to see libraries and museums as institutions whose contributions to the intellectual, cultural, social, political, and even identitarian life of their communities are very closely related. In other words, I would conceptualize libraries and museums as both intellectual cousins and practical partners in the ambitious enterprise of keeping the ideas and perspectives and understandings of past generations and distant cultures available to as many people as possible. They're both built, uh, the two of them are built uh, primarily on somewhat different ingredients, books in one, artifacts in the other, but as I see it, they present many of the same opportunities and have to deal with the same set of challenges. And I would cite in particular, first, a need for conservational care, including physical interventions such as restoration of objects. Secondly, a need for selectivity, making choices about what items out of the limitless possibilities to include and what to leave out. Third, a need to group the diverse materials in categories that are at once substantively appropriate and user-friendly. And fourth, perhaps most importantly, a need to decide what level of access to allow, to whom, and on what conditions. First, the mundane task of conservation, that is removing mold, fumigating, repairing tears, and so forth, is a particularly important part of museum work. 
but libraries are also involved in keeping their contents in good physical condition. The Mintz collection that we're honoring today, for example, included, I've learned, 285 books that according to the report drawn up in Puerto Rico were in, quote, urgent need of conservation. Secondly, in terms of selectivity, the decision about what stays in and what goes out is an ongoing issue for all kinds of collections. As a museum example, I would cite the lively debates in Paris about what parts of the French Anthropology Museum's collections of books and artifacts to keep when the museum was dismantled two decades ago, which parts to send over to the new Museum of Non-European Art, which ones to combine with the holdings of the former colonial museum, and which ones to send down to Marseille for a museum of Mediterranean culture. But the need to make selections also constitutes part of the ongoing process of library and archival collections. I've learned, for example, that when Sid Mintz prepared his personal books and papers for donations, he chose to include nothing about Tasso or Worker in the Cane in the documents that he gave to Puerto Rico, not even a, co a copy of the book. Instead, giving all his papers relevant to that project to Johns Hopkins, and the recordings that he made with Tasso to the Library of Congress. In the French case that I mentioned, the reasons for the decisions about what to keep in the library of the Anthropology Museum and what to send off to other collections are pretty clear to me, but the motivation behind the division of Sid's collection, the decision to keep Tasso-related materials in the US rather than giving them to Puerto Rico, isn't something I know about, and it may be that in the discussion period afterwards, someone here will be able to tell us something about them. <clears throat> Third, both libraries and museums are by definitions built on classifying. Each item needs to be assigned to one or more categories, and those categories are supremely negotiable, reflecting particular understandings and priorities based on political orientations, personal taste, and much more. Cross-referencing helps to recognize that books and museum pieces usually fit into a number of different categories. For example, a study of Taino Indian pottery can be classified with both books on native peoples of the Caribbean and books on ceramics, but it still needs to be placed on the shelf of only one of those categories. In my experience, museums are particularly ill-equipped to deal with the complex and sometimes multiple identities of the objects in their collections, especially as the collections are handled over the years by a series of curators and other experts, each of whom contributes new ideas about the identity of particular objects. I want to digress for just a moment to share an example from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Am I? Let's see. Yes, okay. Where am I? This is the very impressive online site of that museum, which gives full access to all its collections, beginning each search by asking you to click on the continent that you're interested in. Now, a few months ago, when I needed some information on a Suriname room collection from the 1920s that Rich and I had seen in the storeroom many years earlier, I very logically clicked on South America, because that's the continent where the Suriname rooms have lived for the past 300 years. But my computer screen replied that there was no result. So it was only by contacting the curator in charge of South America that I learned the reason. Oh, she said, that's easy to answer. The museum's maroon collections have been moved to the African division. Now it's true that the 17th and 18th century ancestors of the Maroons did come from Africa, but it's not clear why the museum would want to send them back there, physically, <laughs> physically, conceptually, and even digitally. All I can imagine is that some curator looked at photos of the Suriname Maroons and concluded that people like these could only have lived in deepest Africa. Fourth is the question of access. 
This currently lies at the very center of active developments in both the library world and the museum world, though for slightly different reasons. For libraries aiming for maximal use of their holdings, digitalization holds the promise of universal access, and efforts are going forward, uh, most notably in the creation of the Digital Public Library of America, which, by the way, includes both libraries and museums, to make virtually everything available to virtually everyone. Now, for museums, on the other hand, the argument for increased access is closely related to the very thorny question of repatriation, with many analysts feeling that open access offers the most sensible solution to demands for repatriation. Anthony Kwame Apia and others have argued, for example, that free access to cultural heritage is much more important and more feasible than sending physical objects back to the culture or the, uh, the country from which they came. Now, I want to mention just two examples that illustrate the trickiness of policies regarding access, one involving a library and the other a museum. When I was working in Paris in the 1980s, I often went to the library of the Anthropology Museum to consult books and articles. There was no admission fee, and that made access to the library free and open to anyone. Like everyone else, I would begin by filling in three request slips for items that I was interested in, which the librarians would then find in the stacks and bring to me. If, however, those three items did not contain the information I was looking for, the three book rule meant that I had to go back to the metro, return home, and come back to the library the following day with another three requests. Now that might seem like an antiquated system, but variations on it are still in use today. For example, I mean, the access is very tricky. If you want to explore something in Sid Mintz's archive at Hopkins, you need to guess which of the hundreds of files will contain the material you're interested in and then apply for access to them 48 hours later. My example of the challenges of open access in a museum context is a little more troubling, both because it's operative right now in 2016 and especially because of the people it concerns. Here's how it goes. France's new museum of non-European art has begun offering free admission to young people aged 18 to 26 as part of the country's effort to encourage museum going among that generation. However, a European passport is required to prove your age. So what that means is that students from Mali, for example, have to pay the full admission price to see the museum's prized possession an imposing statue that was brought to France from their home country, quite possibly illegally, while Parisians of the same age get to see it free. And that, remember, in a museum created in order to celebrate non-European cultures. In addition to libraries and archives and museums, there's another phenomenon that fully qualifies as a collection, which is memory. And that's why, after all, we refer in English to the contents of memory as recollections. In Spanish, the link between memory and, and collections is lost because the English word recollections becomes simply recuerdos. So, but in any case, using that as a rhetorical bridge, I want now to shift gears and devote the rest of this talk to some personal reminiscences, recollections, recollections, if you will, of the people behind the donations that we're inaugurating today. Gordon, Gordon Lewis was someone I knew mainly from things that he'd written and only fleetingly from personal contacts. And his foundational contribution to Caribbean studies has in any case, uh, or will in any case be partially addressed uh, in Rich's talk tomorrow. But I do remember several wonderful evenings spent at Gordon and Sybil's house. I can still taste Sybil's kalulu. It was fantastic. Coming away with a feeling of having been so privileged to hear their reflections on Puerto Rico 
and the larger Caribbean. I also have vivid memories of being driven back from one of those evenings with Gordon straining upward as best he could in order to see over the dashboard of the large American car that he was driving. I had thought it was an Oldsmobile, but I have, my memory has been corrected. It, it was apparently either uh, a Chevy Impala or a Ford Grand Torino station wagon. Rich and I also saw Gordon and Sybil several times at meetings of the Caribbean Studies Association. We once watched, for example, as an outdoor band in St. Kitts struck up a Caribbean waltz and the two of them took to the dance floor to execute the steps with impressive style. We also had active dealings with Sybil in her role as editor of the Caribbean Monograph series. Sid had urged Rich to make a gesture of solidarity with the region by publishing his dissertation in the Caribbean rather than in the United States. And Sybil braved myriad bureaucratic and financial constraints over more years than I like to remember before successfully pulling it off. Later, we had continuing relations with Sybil in her role as managing editor of Caribbean Studies, and Rich was pleased to publish Gordon's Main Currents in Caribbean Thought in the series that he edited at Johns Hopkins. He was also absolutely thrilled when the Association of Caribbean Studies awarded him not one, but two Gordon Lewis Book Prizes. Whoa. Uh, and that's pretty much the extent of the personal memories that I have of Gordon and Sybil, though I also have a, a, a memory that has since been confirmed of offering Johnny the basement of our house in Baltimore because he needed a place to store his belongings when he arrived for study at Johns Hopkins. Okay. As for Sid Mintz, our relationship was a great deal deeper and multifaceted, with twists and turns that would be much too complicated to treat in the context of a 50-minute lecture. So what I'm going to do is limit my remarks today to the first two decades of our 51-year-long relationship in the hopes of shedding some light on the important influence that Sid had on two once-fledgling Caribbeanists, that is, Rich and me. We first met Sid in 1964 for reasons that reflect in interesting ways on the state of the discipline of anthropology at that time. Rich had al already done two summers of fieldwork in Martinique, and he knew that he wanted to focus on the way that the descendants of Africans brought to the Americas in chains had built new societies and cultures. The problem was that Harvard, like virtually all anthropology departments in the country, had no one on the faculty who was even remotely involved in the Caribbean or Afro-America. I know that seems quite amazing today, but at that time, the lack of Caribbean studies fit very comfortably within a vision of anthropology that was virtually unquestioned. Anthropology was seen as the study of people who, in that pre-politically correct era, qualified as primitive. As Sid once quipped, he really got the essence of this, if they don't have blow guns, and if you can't catch malaria, it's not anthropology. <laughs> As a central part of that vision, Harvard had a strict rule that the PhD in social anthropology could not be awarded to any student who had not carried out at least three months of field work in a non-Indo-European language. Now clearly, that ruled out a dissertation on any place in the Caribbean since Suriname, they, including Suriname, since at that time people considered that all Creole languages, including the ones spoken by the Saramaka people, were the bastard offspring of languages such as English, French, Portuguese, and Dutch, and they were therefore classified as Indo-European languages. As Sid liked, to, another quote from Sid, he liked to say, it offends sensibilities within anthropology to say, 
you studied Puerto Ricans or you studied Haitians, it's simply not exotic enough. Rich eventually slipped through the system thanks to a rather bizarre loophole. He had already published papers on three summers of fieldwork that he had done with Indians, one with Quechua-speaking Indians in Peru and two others with Zinacantecos in Mexico who speak a Mayan language called Tzotzil. So he was freed to undertake fieldwork with Sarmacas and their Indo-European language. In any case, given that Harvard couldn't support his interest in the Caribbean, it was Rich's very good fortune to discover that Professor Mintz, whose book on Tasso he had read, was spending the 1964-65 academic year as a visiting professor at MIT, just down Mass Ave. Sid generously agreed to offer Rich a reading course on the Caribbean, launching a relationship that flourished and grew over the subsequent two decades. Rich's memories about that reading course, which he shared with me when I was preparing this lecture, centered on Sid's strong encouragement for a voracious and eclectic embrace of approaches to the region. The first week's reading, he told me, was Alejo Carpentier's El Reino de Este Mundo and C.L.R. James' The Black Jacobins. Sid repeatedly stressed the importance of tapping all genres, from novels to social science, in order to come to an understanding of this complex region that was built on the backs of so many different peoples in so many different situations. And although Sid had already stopped doing field work uh, at that point, he offered Rich strong encouragement for the idea of undertaking ambitious long-term field work in Suriname. Now, I didn't attend those classes at MIT, but I do remember, I was 20 at the time, I do remember inviting Sid to lunch in our apartment in Harvard's married student complex, doing my best to prepare a meal in my then very limited culinary repertoire, but then being told by Sid that all he wanted was a bowl of a specific kind of Campbell's soup. <laughs> in my memory, I think it was either tomato or cream of mushroom since he'd put on a few extra pounds and he was towing the line of a strict diet. Little did I know that many years later, he would be eulogized as the father of food anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> Following his time at MIT, Sid returned to, the, to Yale, but he continued to serve as a very generous mentor for Rich. We drove down to New Haven every couple of weeks to spend Saturdays with Sid and Jackie and what had begun as a professor-student relationship began to expand into something much wider. When we returned from those visits, our Volkswagen Beetle was often piled high with books that Sid had loaned us from his library. Not just the sorts of things you might expect, such as capitalism and slavery, but also a whole variety of books about Caribbean culture. We remember taking back, for example, all five volumes of Fernando Ortiz's Los Instrumentos de la Musica Afrocubana. And when we began to explore the possibility of fieldwork with Saramac Maroons in Suriname, Sid offered us strong encouragement. A few months ago, I found a folder in a filing cabinet in Martinique, in our in the house in Martinique, filled with letters between Rich and Sid often three or four tightly single-spaced typed pages, and always on onion skin paper designed to minimize the cost of postage. Reading those letters brought me back to, brought back memories uh, of the pre-email and even pre-zip code world of long ago. Sent from Paris, Amsterdam, Suriname, Iran, New Haven, and Martinique. They included ruminations on papers in progress and research worth reading that showed an exceptionally close personal and intellectual relationship, which included real generosity on Sid's part in guiding Rich's early articles and academic decisions. They also included a lot of back and forths about book buying with Sid suggesting titles that he encountered in his visits to antiquarian booksellers in Paris and elsewhere, and then later on asking Rich for advice on what to buy from Dutch booksellers, such as uh, S. Emmering in Amsterdam. 
From the very beginning, Sid encouraged Rich not only to read, but also to buy books, as many as he could possibly manage on a graduate fellowship, with the aim of building a personal library that he could consult over the years. That advice launched a serious book buying habit that has ended up being absolutely crucial for us, especially since we've been living in the rural Caribbean, far from libraries, but with in-home access to some 6,000 books, which we call on pretty constantly. Clearly, the donation of Sid's library to Puerto Rico has also benefited enormously from that book buying habit. When Rich and I came back from two years in Suriname in 1968, Harvard was still devoid of anyone who dealt with the Caribbean, so we decided to base in New Haven, where we could spend time with Sid and Jackie. One particularly pivotal thing that Sid did that year was to introduce us to Harry Hootink, who, as you know, um, a former professor at the University of Puerto Rico and director for five years of this very instituto. He had just arrived for visiting positions at Yale and then was going on to the University of Texas. We hit it off with, Tari, uh, with Harry immediately and we kept in close touch from that point on, especially during several years that we spent in the Netherlands where we often passed Sunday afternoons together eating Dutch pankoeken at Apostrop in a restaurant by a canal and dreaming about moving someday to the Caribbean. Harry and his wife Ligia were thinking about the Dominican Republic and the two of us, Martinique. We had countless deep discussions, very deep discussions, about the financial planning and other logistics that would allow us to make those moves. Though in the end, Rich and I were the only ones actually to, to put our plan into practice. Harry was as central a player in our life as anyone has ever been. Uh, I don't think that's right. Did I go by Harry's? Okay. Um, so we were, we were very, very close to Harry until his death in 2005. This is a photo taken on the occasion of Harry's retirement at which Sid, Dick Morris, uh, the, the former director of the institute here, uh, Tony Mango, Frank Knight, Kurt Osteen, the, the two of us and several other Caribbeanists gave talks. Harry, who's next to Frank Knight in the last row on the right, was a very modest person. So although the event was held in his honor, he kind of hid himself back in the rear of the photo. Um, the year that Sid introduced us to Harry was also the year that he supported Rich's bid to join the anthropology faculty at Yale, helping to secure a position for him as assistant professor with the first year off for a postdoc in the Netherlands. When we returned to New Haven, we moved into Sid and Jackie's house, uh, enjoying Sid's company, and as I remember, quite a few useful tips on cooking for several weeks before he left for his sabbatical in Paris. Subletting that house for a full academic year, was inclu which included access to Sid's personal library, was, needless to say, a very, very precious treasure. Then, in the spring of 1974, Rich was invited to found a new department of anthropology at Johns Hopkins, a university that had a couple of anthropologists in the sociology department, but no department of anthropology. Sweetening the offer was a large grant from the Rockefeller Foundation that was designed to fund a program in Atlantic history and culture, building close ties for the new department with a very distinguished department of history. After some soul searching about the downside of leaving what felt like a very comfortable position at Yale, Rich and I decided to make the move, even though we were quite worried that it might not be possible for him to attract serious scholars in the very unpredictable adventure of launching a new department from scratch. That fear was, however, allayed late one night when Sid phoned to say that he and Jackie had been talking things over and that if Rich would have him, 
he'd be interested in coming to Baltimore too. That was truly cause for celebration, since it promised to remove a lot of the uncertainty about what had been feeling like a very risky career move. So, after moving to Baltimore and setting up the department during 1974-75, Rich was very happy to have Sid join him the following year, and at that point, I also began my formal uh, graduate education, and my relationship with, str uh, with Sid strengthened as he became for me an inspiring teacher, a mentor, a dissertation advisor, and eventually a colleague. The department quickly became, as David Scott has put it, the premier training institution for Caribbeanist anthropologists, not only because of Sid and Rich, but also because of its active recruitment of graduate students from the Caribbean. For example, Rolf Tuyot, Val Carnegie, Trevor Purcell, Gertrude Fraser, and Lucia Desir, as well as others who were working on the Caribbean, such as Ken Bilby, Ira Lowenthal, Sam Martinez, Chuck Ruthizer, and Brackett Williams. Its program in Atlantic history and culture was a focal point for Caribbean studies and for the historical orientation that Sid and Rich had both stressed from the very beginning. It offered a yearly seminar, which was generally run by Rich and his colleague, and his colleague in history, David William Cohen, and the Hopkins Press established its Atlantic history and culture collection, Rich's senior editor, which brought out a whole series of books from Walter Rodney's History of the Guyanese Working People to Gordon Lewis's Main Car Occurrence in Caribbean Thought. The fact that one of the department's seven positions was reserved for a distinguished visitor each year contributed real dynamism as students had the chance to study with Sir Edmund Leach, Frederick Barth, Del Himes, Stanley Tambaya, and other luminaries of the anthropological world. And of course, there were frequent visits by colleagues from the Caribbean. That, for example, is how Rich and I first launched our friendships with George Lamming and Nancy Morejon. Throughout all this, Sid Mintz was the uncontested doyen of the department, and in 1984, the university recognized his important contribution by presenting him with the prestigious William L. Strauss, Jr. Chair. The university referred to it as a professorial chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. But they didn't give him anything remotely resembling what we would call a chair. So we did the best, Rich and I did the best we could to mark the event by presenting Sid with a carved stool that we had collected in Suriname. And we had some pretty memorable uh, events in Sid's honor, including a lavish 60th birthday party at the Textile Museum in Washington with anthropologist Maurice Godelier flying in from Paris for the occasion, and later a festive celebration of the publication of Sweetness and Power, giving the party in our backyard. The Sweetness and Power party was held in the spring. And so we decided to give it a Stravinskyan theme by, in, in the invitation by converting the Sacre du Printemps into the Sucre du Printemps. In Spanish, you know, it's like uh, tweaking Primavera Sagrada to make Primavera Azucarada. Another set of memories that I have said during what I think of as, as the Hopkins years was our collaboration on the collection of essays that began as a Woodrow Wilson pamphlet series and was later published as Caribbean Contours. Whoa. Sid and I began by brainstorming together about what subjects to include and what scholars to invite, and Sid then drew on his considerable clout with fellow Caribbeanists to persuade them to join in the adventure. His letters of invitation reflected, which were quite long, reflected an impressive command of each proposed subject, and I don't think anyone refused his invitation. Then we wrote the introduction together, each drafting parts and passing them back and forth for comments and revisions. When the chapters arrived, I was the one to take care of the editing, and that's where I had a face-off with Sid's good friend, Jerry Hagelberg, who contributed the essay on sugar. I had innocently replaced the word 
the British word ton, T-O-N-N-E, by the American expression metric ton. But Jerry was quick to accuse me, rather testily as I remember, of total ignorance of the language of sugar production, and I very apologetically reinstated his original wording. He wrote to say that he was pleased that I had seen my error, adding in his role as a committed Marxist a lesson that I've often had reason to recall. In the end, he said, you have to understand that the relationship between an author and an editor is a class struggle. <laughs> so <laughs> later, when we were preparing the essays for publication as a book, there was another editorial confrontation, but this time concerning the graphics of the book's cover. Sid and I wanted an image that resonated with the entire region, so we chose this object submitting the identifying text for the back flap. We said, pre-Columbian bone vomit spatula carved by Taino Indians, collection of Fundacion Garcia Arevalo, Santo Domingo. To our dismay, the editors at the Hopkins Press were absolutely shocked at the idea of alluding to vomit on the book's jacket and quickly removed the spatula's ethnographic identity, publishing it simply as an attractive object made of bone. That also clearly reflected a class struggle, as Sid and I were forced to bow before the greater power of the press's marketing department. The Caribbean was the uncontested centerpiece of the Hopkins department for a dozen years, but as the compilers of Sid's Hopkins papers put it, quote, in 1985, Mintz shifted the focus of his work toward the cultural, economic, and social history of food. And the department in which he had played such an important role as a Caribbeanist and mentor for students from the Caribbean took a sharp turn toward the study of global and transnational issues. This was also the year that Rich and I left. Although Yale and Hopkins were the main places where I came to know Sid, there's also another setting, far from Baltimore, that carries Mincian recollections for me. The story begins way back in 1961, when the Journal of Caribbean Studies was founded here in Puerto Rico. At that time, I was still in high school. Rich was only a sophomore in college. But recently, in Martinique, I found an actual copy of one of the first issues on our bookshelf in Martinique. If you look very carefully at the upper right hand corner, you'll see that it was originally Sid's copy, presumably given to Rich because he had an extra one. There must be close to a dozen books in our house that bear Sid's signature since he often gave Rich copies of things that he had in duplicate. This early issue of Caribbean Studies consisted of 53 pages typed out on letter-sized paper on one side only and stapled in the margin. From the very beginning, the journal benefited from the Caribbeanist triumvirate of Harry Hootink, Roger Morse, uh, sorry, Richard Morse, and Sidney Mintz, who all served faithfully on the advisory board over the years. In 1966, Sybil Lewis became its managing editor, and for a number of years, the journal was a crucial outlet for research on the whole region, publishing articles on everything from history, politics, economics, and religion, to linguistics, ethnicity, tourism, education, and more. However, by the 1970s, it had fallen on hard times, and between 1981 and 88, it published not a single issue. As an article by Humberto Garcia Muniz and Betsaida Vélez Natal put it in 2011, referring to the, 90, uh, the 1981 to 88 gap, as well as a similar gap that began in 1996. They wrote, Esos lapsos de la revista coinciden con perio per periodos de crisis en el Instituto de Estudios Caribeños debido a cambios generacionales y de paradigmas de investigación, conflictos internos en la unidad, y la politización de la universidad reflejados en nombramientos desacertados. But the Caribbean, the, 
Caribbean was not the only part of the world experiencing a downturn in publishing on the region. In Europe, there was an equally venerable journal of Caribbean studies that was pretty much on life support. The Westindische Kids had been publishing, whoops, let's see. Yes. Had been publishing continuously since 1919, first exclusively in Dutch, but eventually boasting many contributions in English and some in French by a range of important Caribbean scholars from Melville Herskovitz and Jan Voorhoeve to Irving Rouse and Sidney Mintz. Sid's important article on the historical sociology of the Jamaican church founded free village system, for example, was first published in the West Kids. In 1959, the journal had merged with two other Caribbean publications and continued under the name the New West Kids. When Rich and I first became involved in it in the 1970s, it was still very much in the hands of Peter Wachner Hummelink, a zoologist, botanist, geologist, born in 1902, who was a leading scholar on subjects ranging from petroglyphs to scorpions and geckos. And the focus of its articles tended to respond to his particular interests with titles such as Issues related to the phosphate of Curacao, or a hydroponics farm in Aruba, or the survival of flamingos in South Bonaire, 1957 to 1968. Even the more historical and sociological contributions were somehow failing to capture the spark of late 20th century scholarship on the region. The lamentable state of journal publishing for research on the Caribbean clearly needed to be addressed. And the first step was a meeting, I think it was in Harry Hooting's house in the Netherlands, with Sid, Harry, Rich, and me. There might have been a few others, I uh, simply don't remember. The challenge was to conceptualize an organ for the dissemination of the best of current research on the region. We had very long discussions about how it would be organized, whether it would publish exclusively in English or accept articles in other languages, whether to include poetry and other literary forms, how to attract contributors and subscribers, and of course, where to look for institutional support. I was the youngest, not to mention the least experienced participant, so I was assigned the job of taking notes. I remember hearing the names of a number of Caribbeanists for the first time, and I even learned how to spell Sylvia Winter's last name as part of the job. As we debated who to involve in the project and how to define its purview, the familiarity that Sid and Harry had with the full range of people who had studied aspects of, the Caribbean, of, of Caribbean societies and cultures was absolutely pivotal. And I remember feeling as though I was being treated to a very privileged window onto the central issues and key participants in the field. We talked about the importance of giving the revamped journal a name that could reflect the whole Caribbean, and we decided to call it Manatee. Later on, after funding sources failed to materialize, we abandoned the Manatee idea and held another meeting, also in Holland, to consider a somewhat less innovative solution, which was to dust off the new of Estindish kids. Present at that meeting were Harry Hootink, Bono and uh, Ineke Toden van Velsen, uh, Velsen, our colleagues in Suriname Maroon <laughs> Studies, the two of us, and Wachenar Hummelink, along, uh, along with his longtime secretary, Luz van der Steen. It was held in Wachenar Hummelink's study in Utrecht, an attic room with shelves that had countless formaldehyde-filled jars containing frog and snake specimens. Bono, I, I, talked to, I, I wrote Bono about this, and he said his memory was that there were some jars that also contained formaldehyde-preserved human fetuses, but I cannot attest to that. I'm, I, I, I don't know. Wachener Hummelink had very strong possessive feelings about the journal, which we could easily understand, given that he'd been an editor since 1947, he'd written most of the book reviews himself, He'd carefully overseen the layout of each issue. He'd contributed substantial uh, personal funds to keep it going over the years. 
So our proposition to make radical changes was extremely delicate. But in the end, he acquiesced, and we kept him on the masthead until he died in uh, 2003 at the age of 96. By the time of the second meeting in Utrecht, Sid had bowed out of the planning sessions, but he continued to support the journal actively by contributing quite a few articles and book reviews over the years. In fact, when he died last December, he was working on a review of a book in German by Michael Zuska, having promised us in uh, 2013 that he was going to read one page of its more than 700 pages each day and then draft his comments. So I figure he must have been on about page 450 at that time. Um, okay, time to conclude. A few months ago, an article in the New York Review of Books about the Argentinian-Canadian man of letters, Alberto Manguel, remarked, quote, more than a mere collection, Manguel's library represents the material and spatial extension of his readerly mind. Posthumous voices and literary characters conversing among themselves under his roof. And it described his ruminations on that library as uh, and again I quote, a cartography of his imagination as he roams around, uh, around it, evoking the voices that resound within it. Clearly, the library of a voracious reader, and that certainly includes Gordon and Sybil Lewis and Sid Mintz, documents a lifetime of learning, thinking, questioning, and reformulating assumptions and their books play a pivotal role in that process. Each of the scholars behind the Lewis Mintz book collection penetrated both the singularities and the commonalities of, a whole, of the whole range of Caribbean societies and cultures in innovative ways that have significantly deepened our understandings of the region. Making available the books that fueled their life's work constitutes a very special gift to future researchers. And I can only hope that the cataloging of the collection will soon be completed, that measures will soon be taken to assure the security of its contents, and that it will eventually be made available online so that all of us can begin to draw on its resources. Thank you. Solamente una pregunta sobre la división de la colección, the division of the collection uh, that you pointed out, uh, that part of it went to this place and part to that place, and you had some ideas about that, or you, were you not sure you have the right ideas about why it was divided? The, uh, the um, division between Puerto Rico and uh, Johns Hopkins and the Library of Congress? Yes. I don't know. I don't know, and I assume that maybe somebody here does know, but I, I don't. I don't know how to explain it. Well, I'll just offer a, a suggestion. Uh, Puerto Rico has had a bad reputation in the storage of certain things. Uh, Vidal gave a rich collection of Handicraft II of the Smithsonian. And, and yet, when I came to, when I was doing some work at the art uh, gallery, I found out they had a state of the art. Ricardo Alegría had set up a state of the art multi million dollar facility for the storage of things. So it might have been that there were some thoughts about where they could be taken care of and uh, maybe a reputation rather than a reality had something to do with it. Yeah, I, I know of cases where that kind of thinking has, uh, I mean, that enriches in my experience. Can, can you hear me all right? Or should, 
right to use it. Um, we've had experiences, for example, in mounting an exhibition of Suriname maroon materials where uh, we couldn't get it to Suriname because the conditions were not up to the standards in terms of climate control and all the rest of it. But, but the question is, why Puerto Rican materials as opposed to the other materials? That's, that's really the question. Uh, hi, I, I'm a, a little speechless at the moment because uh, when I started taking courses on the Caribbean, all of these names were like these people who made me think um, about the Caribbean and about the places that I lived for the first time so differently. So kind of seeing the people exist and, and talk about you know, all the stuff they did together is kind of insane. Um, so I guess I'm going to ask a very kind of generic, vague question. What advice after all this legacy, after all this work and, and all this jumping around in places and trying to uh, make these papers work, what, what advice would you give to someone who, who's kind of starting off and, and wants to leave a similar legacy uh, for the Caribbean? Well, I guess, I guess, first of all, don't think about your legacy yet. <laughs> think about what you're interested in and how are you going to go about studying it. And that's, <laughs> but, you know, we're here to honor uh, Sid and Gordon and Sybil, and they're the ones who, who's, it was work, I mean, I, sh I can't be telling you <laughs> how to do that, but I, I Thank you, Sally. That was wonderful. Um, uh, David Lewis, I'm wondering, there's an institutional slash career undercurrent, which for all of you who knew my parents never existed in their life. Um, the man left Britain in 1947 and discovered a place that didn't have 300 days of rain and gray skies and said, why should I ever go back? Um, and never thought of you know, that institutional career issue, but clearly we've got an undercurrent history, Columbia, uh, Harvard, Yale, Johns Hopkins, more recently places like FIU, Puerto Rico obviously, University of the West Indies, and, and I'm wondering uh, your experience and your views on the difference between being in region and out of region, and particularly now that you and Rich after uh, storied career out of region came back to region and you know what that means in terms of the disciplines and so on because obviously the institutional support at some point is is critical um, you know the last thing despite all his mantra of do your research write, work on your own you know Gordon would have a very hard time justifying that to any young scholar because you need, you can't do that on your own. I mean, these are one in a lifetime experiences like Sid's, like your own. So any comments you can share on that? I mean, Rich and I were really privileged to uh, enjoy the best of institutionalized situations and now the best of non-institutionalized situations. I mean, the years that we were at Hopkins were quite amazing. Um, I think in a large part because of the students who were chosen to be part of that program. They're, they're just, um, it was a marvelous community and a very enriching experience. Now that we are out of that system, it's like Gordon, we, we enjoy the absence of all the rain and cold and so on. So, um, and we have found uh, it possible to be you know, to keep going uh, partly uh, because of email connections to be involved, closely involved with a community of scholars, even though there we are sitting out, you know, beyond the reaches of uh, institutional paraphernalia and so on. The other thing I would say is that institutions have changed over the, over our lifetimes. I mean, 
If we started in the 1960s, now we're in the 21st century, our final experiences in uh, academic institutions in the United States, that is at William and Mary, began to be more and more uh, dominated by those aspects of institutional life that we did not appreciate. That is to say the bureaucracy, the review boards, the meetings, uh, and so on, which we did not have at Hopkins. Hopkins was beautifully free uh, of all that. So that there has been a real change in the, in the benefits of being part of an institutional environment. I don't know if that answers your question. As you were talking about your personal experiences, I, I feel you, you also had a privileged experience regarding the ups and downs and the convolutions of Caribbean stories over the last three, four decades at least. What's your appreciation, given the occasion for this talk, about the state of Caribbean stories today. Yeah, yeah. I, I, here, I am, here I am debating how to how to address that question, and Rich is signaling me to say I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. So, so. That's fair. Fine. Okay. I'm not trying to whistle out of you, but, but, yeah. We need our audience tomorrow. <laughs> the, we're running, we're running. One more question, okay? Just one. Just one. Okay, let's. Hi, this is uh, Johnny, and I um, just wanted to say that the, um, the famous storage uh, facilities that I use at your house uh, actually ended up um, uh, being, sh the stuff actually ended up in uh, Sid and Jackie's uh, basement at the end of my career at uh, Hopkins in, uh, in 86. So I just wanted to publicly thank you and Sid and Jackie as well for your excellent storage facilities. And uh, you know, I, um, uh, your presentation really brought me down memory lane because when I was at Hopkins, from 82 to 86, it really did coincide with that moment at, uh, at Hopkins when, uh, when there was a real, uh, you know, flurry of academic thinking, academic uh, production. You mentioned David William Cohen, who was in fact my thesis uh, mentor at the time, and I recall quite vividly sitting at the, um, uh, at the large seminar room uh, at Hopkins, I sat in on one of the graduate seminars in Atlantic History and Culture and Society, which was led by uh, both uh, uh, Bridge and, uh, and Sid. And it was, um, you know, I feel that um, uh, your particular presentation really has uh, allowed me not to ever take for granted the very historical moment that I actually lived in. Uh, at Hopkins as, a, uh, as an undergraduate and a graduate student, and I didn't really appreciate it at the time. I really didn't really know um, what, um, what that uh, real uh, tremendous you know, community of uh, tremendous uh, thinkers uh, was actually given to me. So I want to thank you personally because I, I really um, uh, felt myself transported back to, uh, to that beautiful home on campus. And, uh, you know, and I quite recall uh, a lot of your graduate students uh, and SIDS who uh, became my own personal friends here at that time. So, you know, really, thank you very much. That, yeah, I should also say that I am very grateful to have had the invitation to go back to, to, um, to find SIDS letters from, you know, from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, it was a real trip for me. So I, I feel the same way. I feel like I um, revisited a time that was very meaningful to us. No. On collections. No. What's the point of collecting books in the age of the internet and digitalized books? 
Um, that's a question that you should address to my daughter. <laughs> she, she's, she's the one who really thinks about that. I still like to read books with pieces of paper that I turn, you know. Uh, as book review editors for the New West Indian Guide, Rich and I have started getting uh, responses from publishers uh, when we request a book to, uh, to be reviewed. And they say, we'll send you a PDF. And we have reviewers who say, I'm not interested in a PDF. I want the, you know, I want the book. So I think we're in a transitional time when um, I, I would guess that a younger generation is uh, so used to reading online that it doesn't really matter. Uh, I feel like I'm an old generation who we still really like, I, I like book covers, I like book design, <laughs> I like the physical book and so on, but clearly we're, we're, that's changing. And, and we see it very clearly in, in the book review uh, editing that, that we do. Uh, it's changing very rapidly, actually. So, so we will close with Jackie's question. Yeah, Sally, I've, I've been thinking about the question that was yeah. Um, that was asked about why suits collected were in different places. Um, and to the extent that I remember, I think that, for example, the Tasso recordings, um, somebody from the Smithsonian asked him, would he like to contribute them to whatever collection they were amassing? And he thought that was a good idea. He never thought about his legacy in that sense. And that was a good safe place to have it. And it was well before um, he thought of donating his library here, so the two are kind of separate. Um, as, as for, um, what was that other thing? Oh, his archives. Again, it was because he was wondering what to do with them, and Hopkins, the library, said, you know, we'll take them. These are terrific. So they're, unfortunately, for researchers, they're in separate positions, but you can understand why, except for the library that he donated here. He didn't think of it as a legacy. In terms of the library here, he had um, a longer range of ideas. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bien, pues, un millón de gracias.